Somerville Livewire. I'm Ariel Amir. What do you think about the outdoor dining in Davis Square? Do you like it? Have you enjoyed it? Do you want to see more of it? Well, imagine if walking down Elm Street, not only is there outdoor dining, but there are no cars. You can just walk across Elm Street, stroll along, kind of like Quincy Market. Does that idea appeal to you? Or are you one of those people who you just want to park your car, dash into McKinnon's, pick up, get your pizza and so forth. And the idea of no parking, no driving down Elm Street drives you nuts. Well, there's a proposal out to do just that, make Elm Street pedestrian only. And so to discuss this proposal and all of the issues related to Davis Square, we're joined by Jack Connolly and Chris Iwerks. And Chris is the founder of davisnow.org and is the architect who designed the pedestrian plan for Elm Street. And he is also a Somerville resident and um, has been very involved in many initiatives within Somerville. So Chris, thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Um, and it probably would be what, go ahead. No, go ahead. I just wanted to introduce Jack Connolly, who okay. is a lifelong Somervillian a uh, business owner and homeowner in Davis Square. He served 17 terms on the city council for Ward 6, as well as a uh, counselor at large. And he's played a critical role in the transformation of Davis Square since the T-stop came. So he has shepherded all of those um, advancements and innovations that make Davis Square wonderful today. So thank you very much, Jack, for joining us. Delighted to be here, Mary Ellen. It's a work in progress. <laughs> So, Chris, I don't know, did you want to clarify something that I I'm just said? going to get a little, just a slight bit of context to, um, before talking specifically about making Elm Street pedestrian. And that's that the, uh, the Davis Square that we see today is actually an act of opportunism um, that was not anticipated uh, very long in, in advance of it actually happening. And that's because the MBTA had in, uh, planned to extend the red line out to uh, Arlington Center, but Arlington declined to have such a uh, risky thing show up in their neighborhood. And Jack and the administration at the time jumped on that opportunity and, and persuaded the MBTA that they should have a stop in Davis Square. And so that's what we have. But in addition to that little bit of opportunism came with it a whole uh, urban infrastructure a plan for which is you can see today, which is the brick sidewalks, the brick plazas, um, Seven Hills Park, and um, the Davis uh, Square neighborhood plan has been developed, been developing. I don't know if it's quite complete yet, um, but it is looking to build on what was created here. And the Davis uh, Now website and the, the punch list that we put together is a counterpart to that. It's really a specific accounting of all the things in the square that have deteriorated and need repair and really haven't yet gotten attention. Uh, part of the neighborhood plan discussions, occasionally someone would mention, well, maybe we should make Elm Street pedestrian, but that never got anything like traction. It, was, it always had a kind of that could be interesting, but there's no impetus for it. And it wasn't until the pandemic hit us and the, the, um, another act of opportunism arose that was not expected, which is outdoor dining everywhere, and, you know, including Elm Street. And that was a lifeline for restaurants and lots of people when the weather was reasonable could eat outside. Um, so that's part of the impetus for kind of re-examining, well, what if we made it pedestrian? Uh, the other side of it is if you've ever eaten out on Elm Street at a place, you know, uh, that's right on the, um, the vehicle path, the, the, the single lane vehicle path, you can be eating, you know, two, three feet away from trucks that are driving by. Garbage trucks are always a treat. Um, added spice to your meal. Um, and it's, so it's not an ideal setup for um, the opportunity that exists. But if we were to close it to traffic except for service vehicles off hours and create a pedestrian street out of it for two blocks. Um, it could be a vastly improved environment. And particularly, I mean, one of the keys to this is elevating the surface in there so that there's not a distinct street sidewalk zone, but it's, it's all one surface maybe delineated 
with a, a lane down the center that's for say bicycles or service vehicles, but it creates something that is much more like other pedestrian seats or streets around the world. And there are lots and lots of examples. Some of them I put onto our website. There are many, many more. Um, and Right, so, so just if I could just jump in. So you're envisioning this as a this permanent is, change. Mm -hmm. Like, like Quincy Market is one of the um, examples that you give, which is obviously it doesn't change weekends. You know, it's it's just that is what it is. That's what it's designed to be um, That's right. on a permanent basis. That's right. That's what That's I was getting. And and the other thing is this um, allows the intersection to be simplified into something closer to a four-way intersection with dedicated lanes for each um, path of travel coming into the square. It has a left turn lane and a through lane through right. Turn lane. The colored plan that was done in the neighborhood plans has a single lane, which if anybody who's driven a car would know, doesn't work when you come to intersections when there's any amount of traffic. If you have to wait for someone making your left, it's backed up forever. Yeah, the traffic in Davis Square, as I have driven through it, I live about a block away, is, you know, it can be interesting at times, you know. Um, so, it, and it, it, you know, it seems like there's more traffic all the time. Um, so, Jack, you know, obviously, as Chris said, you've been involved with this, you know, you've lived here your whole life and watched the entire transformation. How does this strike you? Well, I'm very excited to be honest with you, Mary Ellen, because what Chris and the Davis Now folks have done uh, and taken advantage of this opportunity is to at least create a framework for what could be. And if you would ask me back in the late 60s, uh, when there was a freight line running through the Davis Square every day, twice a day, I would have said, you're absolutely crazy to think of anything. And, and, and how could a freight train not be coming through the square? Because it had been for 40 or 50 years. But the opportunity to make a big change, not only to make Elm Street a pedestrian way, but also to configure traffic so that may resemble what it used to be. If you look at... Um, uh, Chris's drawing, it would also make Highland Avenue a two-way street. It would make that octopus of Highland, College, um, Holland Street, Dover, Day, and Elm uh, manageable. So imagine being able to go from Dover Street, head north, straight across, and pick up College Ave like we were able to do for many years up until the 70s. Uh, that's something that potentially could happen with the iteration that, that Chris has. Just last weekend, anybody who participated in that beat, Mary Ellen, probably saw how easy it was to walk around the square. Plenty of their stores and shops were very busy as a result of a kind of a cloudy, not super, super hot day like we've seen in the past. And I think that enlightened even more too. This is a concept that certainly merits consideration. And you know what? It might be something and the, the discussion should ensue. And that's going to be, I think, the big role we have to do now is to make sure to enlighten people at City Hall as we come out of COVID and people are anxious to get back. I think the outside dining is going to stay for quite a while. Parking has been eliminated primarily in the middle of the square. So you can see that that concept uh, uh, is certainly doable. Let's have the discussion. I'm anxious to get involved. I know a lot of people, uh, thanks to Chris and the work at Davis now, are willing to do the same. Well, it's interesting because I've been talking with some other people in the community and some of the questions that have been raised is, you know, are about the, um, first of all, how is traffic going to be routed around the square? Um, what about elderly and disabled people getting to the, you know, to the shops and business that would be lost um, in terms of, you know, people, you know, putting in an order on the phone or online and stopping by and making a quick stop to pick up those things. So I know over the years, as you guys have both been considering these issues, you know, this isn't the first time these issues have come up. So Chris, what are some of the, you know, the things that people have raised with you about their concerns? Like, what are your, what are good, what are the things that you're going to have to sell people on? Well, I guess I would cut the the, not cut it, but I would, I would describe the process of thinking about this slightly differently. At a conceptual level, there's the question of, is this a, a good idea or not? And I think your poll probably shows that most people think this is a good idea. And, you know, di at a diagrammatic level, 
You could imagine that it, it could work very well. It works other places. Um, on the other hand, there are people who are opposed to it. And th what I read about the, the nature of um, why they wouldn't like it is they wouldn't be able to drive up to the front door, um, the accessibility issues. And I would say for both of those kinds of things, you never could do that. You never could get in your car or have the expect expectation that you would get in your car, drive over to Davis Square and park right in front of wherever you wanted to go anytime you wanted to go there. It doesn't work that way. You might get lucky occasionally if you're going to Starbucks at 6 a.m., you could park in front. Um, and the accessibility issue is similar. Um, I'm not sure specifically, that's a blanket thing, right? Like it's the same thing I need to be able to park directly in front of my store. Well, that's not, was never was a realistic um, expectation anywhere in, a, in an urban city. So I, I think that those kinds of questions will continue to come up and part of the process is dealing with them um, as potential criteria. And if they are criteria, how do you actually you know, get at answering them? The other thing I would say is most of the things we're talking about after the conceptual level are more granular. They're the kind of things that when you're in a, in a design office and you're going through a design process, you're gonna go through thousands of issues and possibilities uh, before you get to an end product of design. And the questions about traffic and parking and whether you can reroute things um, are all you know, quite valid issues. And there are gonna be trade-offs. They're gonna be, you can't optimize everything. Um, and there will be things that will be less optimal in terms of any one of those things as, as you spill out a, a final conclusion. Right, and we're gonna, I mean, there are a million things to consider. And just for those watching, what um, Chris was alluding to was um, I, um, in anticipation of um, this show, put a couple of polls up online, one on Reddit and um, a couple on Facebook. We have the results of those, which Jack and Chris don't know the results of, and we will be revealing them, but there were many, many comments that went along with that. So you'll be able to go see those. Um, we'll post that um, after the show um, ends. So Jack, you've been, you know, obviously here for a long time and you know some of the concerns of people. I mean, quite frankly, of the comments that um, were put online and other people that I've talked about, the concerns are people who've been in Somerville for their whole lives. And, you know, to a certain degree, people, people have a way of living and they don't necessarily want to give it up. I mean, it's just, you're, you know, people live here for a reason and it's because it's their home. So, you know, is that something as you're, thinking about imagining the possibilities. Um, what do you see, you know, what, what kinds of things do you think that are going to have to be addressed? And what do you think the new Somervillians um, kind of need to understand about that community in Somerville that, you know, might not be wildly thrilled about this idea? Well, Mary, even back in the 70s when we were talking about bringing the red line, there were a lot of people opposed to even the notion of a subway being planned. <laughs> Never mind planning and building. It was able to, I'd say 20, 25% uh, weren't happy about it. But I think a lot of us that grew up on, uh, on buses and streetcars realized that this, this could be a good thing. Not so much for what comes up out of that hole in the ground, but what you can do going down into it to get you to Boston and other places. So. I think that same spirit now, what, what are the potentials now for Davis? And we saw back in the 70s, early 80s that the potential was terrific back then. Just imagine Holland Street where the Harvard Vanguard building is, is simply a one-story building with two or three bar rooms and a printing shop and basically all wood frame structures. The Sunnibal Theater was closed. Uh, um, the, where the Citizens Bank is was a gas station, uh, a Chinese restaurant and Almy's department store. As a result of all the work that a lot of us did back then, all those things were changed. And yeah, well, there's some people upset that we closed a popular restaurant or that we um, closed down a couple of bar rooms, sure. But guess what? What evolved and what transformed and helped make the square what it is now was the Harvard Vanguard building. Davis has been a service center uh, for over 100 years. Back 100 years ago, it was, it was grain and supplies. Now it's service, banking, health, uh, uh, entertainment and dining. We have evolved Davis and that's what we're going to be doing I think going forward Mary Ellen is seeing the metamorphosis continue if we're able to make the changes as Chris said it took us over 10 years to uh, vet and to 
consider the process of bringing the subway. Originally, there was planned for 60 houses to be taken. Only one house was taken as a result of the interaction between the Davis Square neighbors, businesses, residents, City Hall, the Urban Mass Transit Authority, which is very active. And we were mandated uh, by the federal and, and state transportation people to meet once a month to plan and to work out our sessions. And each 15 minutes of the end meeting was a gripe session, what worked, what wasn't. And so the whole situation evolved to where the red line was constructed and built. And just a real quick aside, a lot of us were very happy to hear that Arlington and actually Lexington, Chris was also part of it. Visionaries wanted to go all the way out to 128. But what happened, Arlington, Lexington said, no, we weren't running into then Governor Dukakis, uh, myself, Joe Mackey, Gene Brune, uh, and just said, listen, uh, Governor, we, they don't want it to go all the way out there. Why can't we have a stop in Davis? <laughs> Fred Salvucci, his champion of deputation, said, well, geez, Governor, if they don't want it out there, we're going to save some millions and we might be able to have a stop on either side of Davis Square. And here we are. So we we're very fortunate that was the case. And I'm optimistic that we're able to go forward. The big thing, Marianne, with ADA requirements and all, the sidewalks, the bricks, the maintenance. Davis now points out, thanks to Chris's yeoman duty for a couple of weeks of taking pictures of all that's wrong, the infrastructure needs desperate repair. I'm hoping if the president's infrastructure plan comes forward, some of it will be able to access some of that money to make those major changes. At the time, we need to make some changes, perhaps with the mall, changing directions of the street. Let's deal with that uh, uh, that six tentacle octopus uh, in total, not just one at a time. Well, first of all, I have to say the t-shirts of the intersection will be much less interesting. I don't know. We got to work on that. But um, you raised the great point, which is all of the other repairs that were slated to begin, I believe. I mean, you know, Chris, maybe you can um, speak to that, which is on your website, you list a lot of improvements that need to be made, as well as the costs associated with them. How much do you think it'll be, it would cost just to make Elm Street pedestrian only without any of those other improvements? And then approximately, you know, how much would need to be spent in order to make it safe for people to walk around, especially people who can't walk so easily? I, I can't tell you the cost because I it's it's um, horizontal construction and I'm an architect and I do vertical construction. So <laughs> to parse that out is something that, you know, it's a someone with expertise in that would need to need to run through that. And, and also it would depend on the design. Um, you know, what kind of paving system we're using. Uh, on top of that, there is the infrastructure work that the city is doing to separate the combined sewer stormwater line that's running down Highland. Before this meeting, I had a quick talk with Brad Rawson because I'd sent Brad this plan and also um, Counter Davis the plan a few months ago. And I'm just checking in with him to see what, you know, they might be able to do about this. And, um, so he pointed out this infrastructure work, which is going to get started. It hasn't, this next segment has just been funded, but it's going to stop at Cutter and Highland. So it's not really entering the square yet. And that's always been held up as a, you know, future construction thing that will prohibit them from doing anything significant in the near term. So time frame is a, another important part of this. But I, I think it, it costs what it costs to do this kind of stuff in the end, you have to repair that street, you have to repair the sidewalks anyway. Elevating it is a relatively minor additional cost because that's fill, you're still putting in a new um, sub base and finishing surface, which is where the money is. Um, but getting it right is what is the, need, the focus needs to be and, and having a vision for what, what this should be in the future. And the sense I get is that that vision is not gonna come from the city it's gonna come from the community. And if, if they hear enough from the community that they want something, they will start moving in that direction to you know, begin doing studies. So this already has the possibilities of doing uh, traffic studies to see what the impacts would be from you know, rerouting traffic. So we have elections coming up, or we have an election with many, many candidates coming up. Who do you think are the key people that if you, you say this has to be driven by the community and obviously we're competing with, for dollars with Union Square and you know all kinds of other places within the city. So who are the people that are, do you know are already on board with this who are either in office or running for office 
and what would be that you know what would be the strategy for community members who want this going forward well let me uh, jump on that mary ellen first yeah. because what is missing right now and as chris alluded to it's going to come from the community back in the 70s and early 80s the davis square task force was a group of ad hoc citizens business owners residents around davis who worked in order to help plan and bring the red line here after the red line was completed, uh, we kept the group alive working with the post-economic development Davis Square, Harvard Vanguard, redo, saving the Snowball Theater, bringing the Citizens Bank building, and a myriad host of other changes uh, to Davis Square. And that vehicle of 20, 30, 40 people meeting once a month at the West Branch Library gave elected officials at the time the pulse of what the concerns were. It didn't matter who they were, but they realized if that many people are active, we were able to go to City Hall with recommendations and conditions for various plans in Davis that made the job of the planning board and the zoning board so much easier because most of the community had already vetted it before the clock started ticking up at uh, City Hall. That's missing right now, sad to say. Um, I think have we have a community group, if Davis now, Davis Square Task Force, uh, um, point two starts up again with the brand new West Branch Library now open with a much larger meeting room. Perhaps doesn't matter who the elected officials are when they hear the voice of the community being active with specific ideas that everybody embraces. It's an easy task. I, that's why I think I was around for 22 years as the Ward 6 guy because it was very easy to be the mouthpiece for what most people in the community wanted. Sadly, that's not there now. Yeah, people just, um, people vote with their feet and they, you know, if they do show up. So Chris, do you have a plan for that? I mean, first of all, I was at the library yesterday. It's fantastic. And the room is scheduled to, the, the large meeting room is scheduled to open in September. So um, that's going to be wonderful. And they have a back plaza so we can even meet outside <laughs> if the weather's good. So Chris, do you have plans for having formal meetings and outreach and a social media campaign and, you know, kind of where, what do you think? Yeah. Well, we're just starting to do that. Um, and I, so I couldn't tell you which of the four mayoral candidates may or may not be in favor of this. But I think what we want to do is get it out in front of them so that they have a chance to think about it and, and uh, you know, establish a position on what they would do if they were in office. Um, just to backtrack a bit, when, when we first launched the punch list, we did get um, a hearing with people in City Hall and the administration. Uh, we met with the mayor a couple of times and he we had the our punch list book he had read through it and he concurred yeah this is this makes sense we had a cost estimate um, for it order of magnitude cost estimate so it wasn't precise um, and he agreed to do it and they did start doing some things they you know straightened poles and painted poles and um, planted some trees on the street but most of the work they never got to and we were going to have a, a, we're calling a BRIC summit in March of last year. And of course that didn't happen. And we, at that, we were going to have um, a representative from the Cambridge Brick Conservancy, um, the company that uh, does bricks all over uh, the state and a landscape architect who knows how to put these things in. Uh, and what we're trying to do is establish a conversation around being able to use unit pavers as an accessible durable material. Um, you can go to Kenny Park right now. Anybody who doubts that this is those things, if you go to Kenny Park and look at the brick there, you'll see that it was laid in 2014. It's sitting there just flat. It's not popping up. Um, it can be done. Yeah. So um, part of this is, is getting buy-in on how you get buy-in. And we had some. The other thing I want to say is that they we asked specifically for a point person within the city who would be responsible to the project and responsible back to us to report. Well, we did get somebody to report to us, but that person, I won't name names, but they were really unable to corral the other departments because it's like silos. And this person doesn't really have any ability to tell DPW what to do or engineering what to do. So, you know, we essentially got excuse sessions rather than um, we're making progress. And like, like you would get from a project manager working in a company that has a contract to do something and they got to get it done by a particular date. Well, if Davis Square can get a T-stop, <laughs> Davis Square, I'll be able to get a pedestrian pathway if they want. 
<laughs> since we got the same people around. So um, do you have, I mean, Chris, where should people go? Should people go to your website, davisnow.org or, you know, what, what are the next steps if people listen to this and they so, want to get involved? So Davis Now is an information site. So you can go there. If you haven't been there, you can go there to see this plan that we're talking about. Um, we have other pieces of um, reaction that we've had to various things that have happened, like the last uh, council election and uh, the punch list is all things sorry, that we've identified as needing repairs. Those are also. In. Yeah, sorry, your um, your connection just got a little garbled. Oh, went off. I really like it to me. No, but it's fine. But okay, so so we are left with if people want to learn more information, is there a place, or will you put a place on your website? Or Jack, do you have any ideas? <laughs> Well, it's our whole get website. involved, Mary Ellen. Get involved. Davis now has got a lot of information, but go on the website, look up activities. I'm at the Traffic Commission at 5:30 tonight about possible parking changes that I'm going to be uh, not happy to uh, uh, to see. So I'm I'm involved. We'll continue to do so. I know Chris has been active and will be. So being involved, call me. Call any one of us. We'll be only too happy to give you some direction where to go. Okay, great. That's perfect. Well, and I'm afraid on that note we have to end because we're out of time i want to thank you both um jack and chris for sharing your thoughts and expertise on this really interesting and important issue and just finally um the results of the poll were 69 percent of the respondents there we had 1232 responses 69 percent said yes they wanted to see this <laughs> so i think there's a lot of enthusiasm for this idea that's a Thank landslide. <laughs> yes, it's a landslide. So of course it's not statistically significant, but um, that looks like where we're going. So for watch for those watching, go to somervillewire.news for more information and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.